All right, in this review video, we're going to quickly go over describing data with numbers. So this is using numbers to describe what we see in data. So we've got a lot to cover in this video. We'll try to go quickly. So one way to describe data is measuring its center. There are two ways to measure a center of data. One is with the mean and the other is with the median. Now the symbol we use for mean, well, there's actually two of them. There's X bar and there's mu. So please make sure you understand that X bar is the mean of a sample of data, a sample of n values. Whereas the uh, mu is the mean of a population. So this would be like the mean of an entire population, everybody, which typically is pretty hard to find. Now the median is used only for a sample of data, and the median we usually just use a capital M, sometimes we just use the word median. But understanding that most people know exactly what these are, but the formula for the mean that you will find on your formula sheet, it is the sum of all the individual X values, all divided by how many total values you have. Now the median, there's no easy form for the median, uh, or formula for the median, but to find the location of the median. This is important. This is not to find the median itself. It's to find the location. You take your sample size plus one divided by two. This will tell you what data value your median will be located at. For example, if you have 21 values, then 21 plus one divided by two is going to be obviously 22 divided by two is 11. So that means that the median is located at the 11th position. So you have to find out, as long as your data is in order, where is that 11th value? So that is how you find the median. Those are the two measures of center. All right, there are three measures of spread. Now, measures of spread describe us how your data is spread out, okay? So one is the range, and the range is very simple. The range is just your max minus your min. Now, be careful, even if the max or the min are outliers, they're still counted as the max and min. So it's literally your biggest value minus your smallest value. The interquartile range is the third quartile minus the first quartile. So hopefully you, you remember quartiles, but basically if your data goes from here to here, the median cuts your data in half. 50% of values are below the median. 50% of values are above the median. And then your first quartile cuts the bottom in half. That puts 25% below it, 25% in between Q1 and the median, and then your third quartile splits the top in half. So basically your quartiles along with your median break your data into 25% chunks. So the interquartile range is not the range of the max all the way to the min, but it's the range of your quartiles. So it's the middle 50% of your data. Think about that. It's the spread of the middle 50% of your data. Now the standard deviation, I'm not even going to show you a formula for it because it's not worth it, right? You're usually going to be given it or you can use your calculator to find it. So the uh, symbols for standard deviation are S. This is the standard deviation of a sample. Okay, kind of like X bar, right? It's from a sample where sigma, this is the standard deviation of the population. Okay, those are the two symbols we have for standard deviation. Now, think of standard deviation as, you know, it's, it's, an, it's how far a typical point is from the mean. So it's not quite exactly the average distance a point is from the mean. It's not like they just average those all together. There's a little bit more to it. Obviously, we taught that you had that in class. But think of it as how far a typical point is from the mean. It's that simple. So again, if you have a large standard deviation, then you're going to be spread a lot further from the mean. It means most data is far from the mean. A small standard deviation means most data is near the mean. That's going to really kind of cluster the data together. All right. Now, the other thing that we want to teach you real quick is what's called the measures of position. A measure of position is what a percentile is. A percentile tells you exactly where your data is located by talking about the percent of data below it, right? So, for example, if I have a sample of 20 people and, and it's all about their height, we're measuring everybody's height, and I fall at the 85th percentile. Okay, what that tells me is that 85% of people in the sample are shorter than me. So that means 15% of people are higher than me, but again, the definition is the percent below. So 85, 85th percentile means 85% of people are shorter than me. If I were to fall at, say, the 10th percentile, 
Well, that means I'm pretty low. And that means that 10% of people are below me, 90% of people are above me. So that's really a measure of position. So your percentile tells you where you or where a particular value falls in the data. Okay, so moving on here, the next big thing to talk about is kind of understanding spread. So I kind of made like four values here. Think of each dot as a value, right? And I wanted to kind of talk about standard deviation and spread. All of these are probably going to have the same mean somewhere right in the middle, right? Because they're all fairly symmetric. The left side and the right side kind of looks the same. But first of all, let's look at these yellow ones right here. These are going to be a very small standard deviation, right? Because all of the values are very, very close to the center. There's not a whole lot of spread at all. Whereas up here, this is going to be a very large standard deviation, these purple dots, okay? Because a lot, you know, the mean's right here in the middle. There's a couple values near the mean, but most values are far to the left or fall far to the right. That's going to produce a very large standard deviation. These blue dots here, they're going to be kind of medium, right? Obviously, it's going to have a um, small standard deviation. It's going to be a little bit bigger than the yellow dots and a little bit smaller than the purple dots. It's more of an even distribution. Same thing with these green dots down here. It's an even distribution. There's a lot of data throughout, a lot of data in the middle, a lot of data to the far left, a lot of data to the far right. That's going to have kind of a medium-ish uh, standard deviation. But again, standard deviation measures how far the data is from, how far typical data, excuse me, is from the mean. So you kind of get an idea of standard deviation with those pictures there. All right, so you know what could be asked of you on the AP test here? Um, typically, you need to know that mean and standard deviation always pair up together. You're never going to talk about a mean without the standard deviation or vice versa because the standard deviation is how far typical data is from the mean. So obviously, standard deviation needs to go with the mean. The median and the IQR also always pair up together as well because the median is the dead center of your data, 50% below, 50% above, and the IQR is a measurement of the middle 50% of the data surrounding the median. So that's why the median and the IQR always go together for spread and center. You also have to be able to find outliers using the 1.5 times IQR method. So let me briefly remind you of that real quick. So Basically, if you're looking for upper outliers, we create what's called the upper fence. What you do is you take your third quartile and you add 1.5 times the IQR. If any values are above that number, then it's an outlier. Okay, a lot of times kids will say, what happens if it's right on that number? Well, first off, it's very rarely going to happen, but I guess it would technically be an outlier. So again, this is going to create what I call an upper fence, UF. Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR, any numbers above that are outliers. Then we have the lower fence. The lower fence is Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR. If any values are lower than that lower fence, then they are deemed outliers. So it's important that you can find outliers. I've seen a couple FRQs that say, find outliers, show all of your work. So make sure you know how to do that. All right. It's also important to know that a larger standard deviation means that typically data is far from the mean. It's more spread out. A small standard deviation means data is near the mean, less spread out. We covered all that as well. That's important to understand. All right, so now let's talk about another measure of position, and that is a z-score. So a measure of position tells you where a particular value falls. Now, a z-score is a unique way to measure where a particular value falls amongst the rest of the data. It measures how many standard deviations a value is from the mean. This is a very useful in understanding where a data value falls, and if it's low, high, really low, or really low. So to find a z-score, it's a very easy formula. You take your particular value, we'll just call that x, you subtract the mean, and you divide by the standard deviation. And what this is doing, and again, you could be positive or you could be negative. Positive simply means that you're above the mean. Negative means you're below the mean. And then again, the bigger your z-score, that's actually measuring how many standard deviations you are from the mean. So for example, if Kelly takes a test in English class and she gets a z-score of 2.5, that means that she was 2.5 standard deviations above the mean. That's pretty good because remember that one standard deviation is how far a typical value is from the mean, right? 
So if we think about the mean being right here, one standard deviation from the mean would be plus one to minus one, right? And within one standard deviation is where most data falls. So for Kelly to be not one, not two, but two and a half standard deviations, sorry for my very poor drawing, but for Kelly to be two and a half standard deviations above the mean means that Kelly scored really, really well. So the important thing you understand is if all I said was, hey, Kelly got an 83 on the test, that tells you nothing. Now, obviously we know from understanding statistics or just basically understanding test scores that she got a B. But, you know, compared to the rest of her class, did Kelly do good? Do Kelly do bad? It all depends, right? I mean, if the mean was 82, then Kelly did just a little bit better than the mean. If the mean was 85, then Kelly actually did worse than the mean. So we need to know where our value falls from the mean. But that's not even good enough. We need to know how many standard deviations we are from the mean. So, <coughs> excuse me. Let me kind of give you a little idea here of what I'm talking about. Let's just say that the mean is an 82 and the standard deviation is 10. Well, to be honest, that means that most kids scored a 72 to a 92. That's where most kids fell, 10 values from the mean, right? One standard deviation from the mean. This means that Kelly did very, very normal. Kelly didn't do great, she didn't do bad. She did score a little bit above the mean, but she was right in the mix of a whole bunch of other people. But if I change this, right? Watch this very subtle change. If the mean was 82 and the standard deviation was 0 0.1, that now means that most kids scored anywhere from 81.9 to 82.1. That's where most kids scored. So now that means that Kelly did unbelievably good. She didn't just do a little bit better than the mean. She did a lot better than the mean. She did multiple standard deviations above the mean. So that's why Z-score really is a nice way to truly understand where you fall amongst the data. <clears throat> All right, so let's kind of look at this uh, example right here just to kind of explain a little bit. So let's say we have two regions. We have region A and region B, and the mean salary for each region is given, and the standard deviation for each uh, region is given, and the number of salaries that we looked at, our sample size in each region is also given. So one thing that we want to be able to understand here is that, you know, obviously region A overall has a higher mean, so they have a higher center, but they're not as spread out, right? Region B is much more spread out. They have a larger standard deviation. So let's just say here, for example, that uh, Mark has a salary of $65,000. Okay. So if he's in region A, what is his Z-score going to be? Well, we would take $65,000, we would subtract the mean, 62,583, 62, and we would, of course, divide by the 6,274, that's his standard deviation. All right, so let's quickly calculate this. We're going to take the 65,000, we're going to subtract the 62,000, 583. Always hit enter first. I get a lot of kids that try to do it all at once. Hit enter first. You don't want to mess up the order of operations. Then we're going to divide by the 6,274. So that means that Mark's Z score is 0.39. Okay, 0.39. So that means that his salary was only 0.39 standard deviations above the mean. It wasn't even a full standard deviation above the mean. So he did, um, he has a little bit of a high salary, but it's not really that high compared at all. So again, that's how you have to understand this. Now in region B, obviously let's check out what his Z-score if he lived in region B would be. Well, that'd be 65,000 minus 60,117. So it does seem that he scores, you know, almost $5,000 more than the mean, but the standard deviation is much, much bigger in region B. It means the data is a lot more spread out. So if I take the $65,000, subtract the $60,117, hit enter, divide by the 9,319. Then notice for this one, his Z score is a little bit higher. It's 0.52. So he's about a half a standard deviation above the mean, but he's still not really that great because again, he's really not that high above the mean. The Z score kind of really tells you that. 
So Z scores are great ways to really understand your position in the data. Just make sure they have no units on them. It's measured in standard deviations from the mean. Okay, the last topic I want to talk about here is transforming data. This is pretty quick and painless, but this does come up a lot on the AP test. So the key things you have to know is that if you're transforming data by addition or subtraction of a constant, this will only affect the center. For example, if I give a test in class and I give everybody five bonus points, I'm going to add five points to everybody's test. That's not going to affect the spread at all. All that's going to do is add 5 to the mean and add 5 to the median because everybody went up. But the data is not any more or any less spread out. So standard deviation, IQR range, they're all going to stay exactly the same. But if you multiply all of the data in your value, all of the values, you know, in your data, then that will affect everything. Um, it'll affect your mean, your median, your standard deviation, your IQR your range. So what's a typical problem on the AP test? I always see this typical problem here. It'll say like new value is three times the old value plus six. And they want to know, you know, how's the mean going to get affected? Well, multiplication and addition both affect the mean. So you would take the mean, multiply by three, add six. Same exact thing with the median. But the addition of six does not affect measures of spread, like we just got done talking about. So for IQR, standard deviation range, all you would do is multiply by three. You would not add the six at all, just multiply by three. Um, a min, a max, those are individual values, so they would be multiplied and added as well. But again, for IQR, range, and standard deviation, you would only multiply by three, you would not add six at all to those values. So that's a very typical AP question, very easy one, hopefully you can get that right. All right guys, so that's really about it, is a quick kind of a recap here over describing data with numbers, pretty basic, but a lot of that stuff you do need to understand.